This video is going to cover to the end of the 2012 puzzle. If you're interested in what happened in the personalized and therefore individually solved parts of the puzzle, feel free to click the annotation to jump ahead. Otherwise, we're going to pick up where we left off, at the address obtained by the phone message. Now, the phone message instructed us to look back at the original image for two more prime numbers and to multiply them. The dimensions of this image were 509 pixels and 503, which multiplied by the 3301 we already had got us at the address for the website. So the only thing originally on this website when you visited was this image and a countdown. The website was checked for a lot of different information at the time. Uh, it appeared to be hosted on a rented server, a Linode. All of the identifying who is information, that sort of thing, had been fairly well filtered. I know in future years, Cicada tended to use a Linode server out of Tokyo. Outguessing the image on the page is really the only unique information we could find, and that just instructed us with this message to come back on the 9th. When visited again, it looked like this. So here they are, the coordinates for a series of posters put up all over the world. This is a map of generally where those got placed. I'm going to make a small aside here before we go on about what the posters were used for, because one of the primary things that people tend to cite when they talk about the numbers or the membership of Cicada are these global postering stages from each of the three years. I think it's a little presumptuous, personally, to try and infer anything about them based on these locations. While it's certainly possible that each poster was put up by a Cicada member, and these show us what cities they're in, they could have just as easily done it in the same way we retrieved them in the following years, by either paying couriers an incredibly small amount to go and remove them, or by getting friends and family in the same cities to go and get them for us. So while I'm not going to say that there is definitely not a Cicada member living in any of those cities, I will say that this evidence isn't really enough to assume that, when it's so easy to get a poster put up in a city you don't live. Regardless, if you manage to go out and actually find one, they look like the images I've been showing. Now, here's where things split a little. In both this and the next step, there's two different paths you can take. For the sake of the video, I'm only going to move along one of the paths, as they do arrive at the same place. I may come back and cover the other path in a later video, maybe once we finish talking about what happened to the winners of 2012. So all of the posters had the Cicada logo and a QR code, which, depending on the poster you got to, gave you one of the following two messages. If you've kept up with us to this point, you'll immediately recognize these as a book code. It's the second part of the message that's really interesting, as it'll recur in several different forms throughout the Cicada years. Each year, there's a point after which the messages sent to you were individualized, and the puzzles changed slightly to make sure you didn't just follow the group along. You actually had to do your own solving. In this year, it's with the line, you shared too much to this point. We want the best, not the followers. Thus, the first few here will receive the prize. Good luck. So we're going to talk about this second one. A poem of fading death named for a king, meant to be read only once and vanish, alas, it could not remain unseen. If you already know much about the 2013 year, you'll find that second line strangely familiar, but in this particular case, we're going to be talking about the poem Agrippa by William Gibson. It was made as part of an art project and distributed on a disc that would scramble its own contents after the first time it displayed the poem on a screen. The project itself was on the transience of memory, which makes an entertaining choice here since, by nature, every solver would only have access to it by second hand. Please refer to my part 1 video for 2012 to see how a book code is solved, because we're going to jump straight to the solution. It's an onion address, and represents the start of the individual stage of 2012. If you don't know an onion address, it's an address that can only be visited while within the Tor network. I'll put a link to the Tor project in the description of the video, but it's just an anonymizing software that uses a particular style of routing. So, as every puzzle received from this point on was unique to each solver, the specifics I go into next will be the general solution, but might not specifically match a particular 2012 puzzle you have. The steps, however, that I follow along should get you to your own solution for that puzzle. So when you went to this onion, you got the following message, to enter an email address you've never used before, and if you did, you received the following in your inbox. So for this next part, you're going to need an understanding of the math behind the RSA encryption scheme. Given the complexity of this and the number of other mathematical theories you need just for a basis of that understanding, I'm likely going to be releasing a separate tutorial on the math behind RSA. What you really need to know is that N and E make up the public key, and N is a product of two very large prime numbers. It's a modulus that all other operations work within. So that this part really would be done individually, each person supposedly had a different N and a different message encrypted using it. 
So the idea behind breaking RSA is that if you can determine the primes that were used in generating n, called the prime factors of n, then you can use them to quickly determine the rest of the variables used in the private key for RSA, including the decryption exponent. The way I'm going to approach that, given the low bit length of n, is just to try and factorize it. If you were to just generate numbers, check them for primes, check them for factors, it would take an incredibly long time. Uh, to be honest, I didn't even do the math to find out how much time it would take. I just immediately went to a faster method called sieving. Sieving we're also going to sort of skip over the math involved, I'll also link to tutorials that you can learn about that, but I personally used a tool written by Brian Gladman. It's called msiv and written in Python. Running it looks like this. The idea behind sieving really is to let normal numbers pass through the relations that you're using to generate the numbers and keep the primes to test for factors, thus the sieving metaphor. So about two and a half hours after I'd finally got everything installed and set up to use this tool, I've got the following result. Obviously this isn't really enough on its own to turn that block of base64 text into a readable message. So I had to write a script that would generate all the other things we needed to turn these factors into a proper RSA private key. Thankfully, 3301 made that part a little easier on us by including some identifiable information in the frame of the encrypted text, the use of the Perl RSA package. And if that was used to encrypt this, we may as well use it to decrypt. So here's what that script looked like. I'm really just creating a copy of the private key by providing the same two prime numbers and the same E, and using it to decrypt the ciphertext as seen here. When this is run, you get a number to take back to that onion site. Now, the last puzzle in 2012 that you received by visiting that site is the MIDI. It's one of the truly unique and very clever steps, and certainly it's one of my favorite puzzles as we go along. I'll play a segment of the MIDI visualized for you and show the message that was included with it. Now, reasonably, there was an insane amount of analysis done on these MIDIs. For brevity, I'm going to talk about the ones that led to progress. If you don't know what a MIDI is, it's just a particular way of encoding notes and lengths to create a song. If you use a tool to convert the song into a readable format, there's some really interesting patterns that emerge. I personally used a tool called MF2T, but there's many others that will lead to the same thing. Now this is what this looks like. One of the first things you might notice is Cicada's name and the headers, but really the relevant thing to see is that there's actually two songs encoded in this file, on two different channels. One is intended to lead us to the solution, and the other is our final message for the year. So let's look back at the text we got when we got sent the song. Let the chorus be your guide is the key here, really, as what follows is a work by William Blake called Song of Liberty, and this particular passage from it is labeled as the chorus. If you take a letter at a time and apply it to the notes in the second song, you'll start to see some patterns. Certain combinations of lengths and notes are repeatedly being assigned the same letter, leading us to be able to associate those and create an alphabet. Now, you would hope that would solve our other song, but if you take a look, you'll see there's actually no notes in common between the two songs, so we need to figure out how they made this alphabet so we can make our own for the first one. Noticing a pattern that shorter lengths and lower notes correlated to earlier letters in the alphabet, I did the following. I isolated all of the combinations of length and note from the first song. The length itself was generated by just subtracting the time on the line for the on of the note and the off of the note. You get this. And if you run this through Bash's sort and unique functions, you arrive at the following list. You'll note it's only 24 entries long, which means for it to be an alphabet, it's missing two letters. I personally got lucky and guessed the two correctly that were left out by skipping ones that are often skipped in older cryptography standards. And I made the following key. Now if we take this back to our big list of notes that was the first song, and start replacing the particular length and note combinations with instead the letter from our key, a message starts to appear. It looks like this when we're finished, or more readably, it's like this. And that's it for the puzzles. You already know that the result of this was the invitation in the leaked email from my first video, and you're probably wondering what happens after that, which we're absolutely going to cover in the next video. However, I personally felt it would be disingenuous to cover it myself, as I wasn't there, so I'm instead going to be bringing in a guest for the next video. One of the 2012 winners who did move forward from this point, who got his invitation, 
and can talk honestly about what he and the other winners did once they made contact with 3301. That'll be the next video in the series, and there might be one more in between in my tutorial series covering the RSA math that we skipped. Until then, good luck.